The station is 94.9 and 99.1 The River. The time is 9 a.m. The day is Thursday, and that means the program is Our Town. And it's brought to you by Decorah Bank and Trust. My name is Darren Swenson, the host of the program. Four guests on the program this morning. Deep conversation with Tim Cronin, the Decorah School Superintendent. A lot of things going on before the start of school next week. We'll have that later on in the program. We'll be joined by Joseph Lensing from Iowa State University Extension. Uh, there's some farmland lease management meetings uh, coming up next week in uh, Howard and Chickasaw County, also Wenashik and Almakee County. Joseph will tell you all about that. Coming up this Sunday night, it's the Northeast Iowa Fields of Faith event putting on, put on by the Northeast Iowa Fellowship for Christian Athletes. Alicia Denner will be uh, chatting with us about that event. But it's the th third weekend in August, and that means you need to make the trip to Protamant. It is check days this weekend. The fun starts tomorrow night and continues until Sunday night. And Mark Panas will join us to uh, chat about check days. Mark will be our leadoff batter this morning on our town. It's brought to you by the Corps of Bank and Trust, and you're listening to it on 94.9 and 99.1 on The River. It's the third weekend in August, and that means everyone needs to go to Protoman this weekend. It's Trek Day is the 46th annual event. Mark Panos uh, joining us to tell us about the event. And uh, Mark, uh, you, I'd imagine you guys are all set to go. How much work uh, goes in and how many people are involved in making Trek Days a reality each and every year? Oh, you know what, Darren? It it takes uh, it takes a lot of a lot of people, a lot of man hours, a lot of women hours, a lot of everything to get this job done. Um, almost every business in town helps out with it. Um, every people from out of town help out with it. Um, huge is uh, the church. Uh, the church parishioners also is big involved because that's it, it's part of their uh, event. Um, baking is on the way. It's check of days is ready to rock and roll. Uh, doing noodles and chicken this week. It, it's here. It is here. And uh, all the fun starts on uh, Friday night. Uh, tell us about the events uh, that evening. Yeah, so Friday night's going to kick off. Uh, six o'clock is going to be the uh, softball tournament begins at the Protoman Ballpark. Um, six, also six o'clock will be the Fireman's Water Ball at the Protoman City Park. Always got a lot of good crowd for that. That's always that's always interesting. I mean, if you've never seen that, Darren, you got to check that out. Uh, but them firemen are pretty talented, I tell you what. Uh, then the community center, of course, all the food gets going there Friday night at six o'clock. Uh, so Tim, the music man, will be there from six to eight, kind of ent entertaining you while you enjoy some cream chicken, chicken noodle soup, uh, kolache rolls, the whole works. Uh, and also new this year is going to be seven o'clock in the main tent. We're doing uh, two movies um, sponsored by Trinity Catholic School. Um, Toy Story, I think, is one of them. I'm not sure the other one at the moment, but uh, that's going to be in the main tent. I know the kids will have free popcorn free juice with that so that should be hopefully bring a good crowd for them too how'd you come up with the idea to have movies on uh friday night uh, i'm not sure that was one that's like i said uh trinity catholic school decided to maybe do something okay. this year so add, add for the kids maybe to kick friday night going instead of just the softball stuff going on now they have something to do for them so it's our first year trying it hopefully it goes over well and, and then we can keep on doing it so and Friday night, that's a heck of a lot of fun. But uh, Saturday, you've got stuff starting at 8 in the morning and continuing till 1 in the morning on Sunday. Uh, if you can't find something fun to do uh, or interesting to do, it's your own darn fault on Saturday. And if you look at the schedule in my mind. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, of course, 8 o'clock is going to kick off the softball again. Um, volleyball then starts at 8 o'clock as well. Uh, 9 to 3 o'clock, we'll have our antique uh, tractor and car show uh, just south of the main tent there. Um, 11 o'clock will be the kids inflatables and that'll last till about five o'clock. So always a good time then for, for, for all the kids, uh, 1130 to one is going to be the, the community band in the main tent, um, 12 o'clock to seven 30, the bingo starts, which always brings a good crowd for that. Uh, cakewalk from one to four, uh, one to five then is going to be uh, barefoot Becky and the Ivanhoe Dutchman. So a great poke band there to listen to, uh, also the beanbag tournament also starts at one down in the main ball ballpark. Uh, 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. is Braylon McCarville from Cresco doing a little entertainment here before uh, before Junk FM will be in the main tent at 9 to 1. And then Tim the Music Band, of course, back in the community center uh, from 6 to 8. So that's all happened Saturday, Darren, and that's going to be going to be a good time, I hope. I mean, 
and, and the weather looks promising, but if you can't make Friday, you can't make Saturday, well, we still got Sunday, August 18th. And what's going on Sunday? Sunday, then again, it's going to be the softball tournament. It's going to kick off at 9. Uh, we're going to have the Polka Mass with Molly B in the church at 1030. Uh, that's always a great crowd. I recommend if you want to go see that, you've got to be there early because that church is, is always full. Uh, so she's doing that at 1030. Um, 1131 is going to be at the community band back in the main tent again. Uh, 12 to 6, bingo is going to run. Um, and then 12 o'clock, 12 to 5, all the kids stuff. And then Sunday is the kids pedal tractor pull. Um, so that's always good, kind of doing some bragging rights for them kids if they want to go out there and see how strong they are. Uh, and then in the main tent, Molly B and Friends will be performing from 1 to 3. Uh, the cakewalk gets back going again from 1 to 4. Uh, and then Molox Fisherman is going to end out the entertainment from 3 to 6 p.m. in the main tent. And then, of course, 6.30 uh, is our Paris quilt raffle auction and then, uh, of course, raffle uh, drawings for all the raffle prizes that uh, you may purchase. So. How can people definitely? Uh, how can people uh, get involved uh, with the uh, parish raffle? Uh, parish raffle. Uh, there's a lot of things that are donated already. We have a list here: seventy three prizes. Um, so each ticket's worth a dollar a piece. Uh, we will sell them all the way up through the weekend um, in the main tent with the ballpark. We sell them all the way up till it starts. So you have all the time. They're a dollar a piece, and you can buy as many as you want. So. But more, uh, the more the merrier, and the better chances of you of uh, winning. Uh, if you uh, buy a few more, of course, you got the beer garden and the main tent and the ballpark all weekend. You mentioned the Prodman Community uh, Center uh, serving hours. Uh, if uh, you need, if you're thirsty, if you're hungry, uh, you got plenty of options uh, this weekend. We got plenty, plenty of options. Yeah. So again, for food, again, we're serving. We're gonna do uh, homemade chicken noodle soup, uh, the homemade cream chicken. Uh, of course, Palach Lockers, Bratwurst, and uh, barbecue pork sandwiches, homemade roller keys, homemade kolaches. We hope we have enough this year. I know we always seem to seem to run out by Sunday, but I tell you what, um, they are great. I, I think we make just over 1,500 dozen, I'm going to say. Uh, wow. so, so, so that's a lot of kolaches that, uh, that, that we make to, to get out and prepare for the weekend, and they're pretty much gone. So, wow. um, yeah, a lot of stuff going on this weekend and, ch and check days here in Protovin for the 46th annual. Um, and, and the weather looks great. Um, I see it's going to be like 76 on Friday, 79 Saturday, and 82 on Sunday. So that's some good weather to uh, enjoy, check days. So It might even be great weather if uh, you really ask a, ask a Norwegian like myself. But uh, we'll <laughs> leave that uh, opinion uh, to yourself there. But uh, yeah. Yep. Obviously, it takes the uh, support of uh, the community to uh, make these people, uh, make these events possible, and especially the music, entertainment, and it looks like you've got a pretty good uh, group of uh, people uh, supporting uh, the music uh, this weekend and bands that are coming to town. Yeah, absolutely, uh, and that takes a lot, because I know I've know i seen more uh, prices of things are going up, and it just seems like it's kind of impossible, but uh, but it takes a lot of people to do that. So sponsoring all our bands this weekend is Arts Milling Service, the Farmers Mill and Protovin Kashatka Farm Equipment, um, the Protovin Booster Club, CUS Bank out of Cresco, Citizen Savings Bank out of Cresco, Fort Agassiz, Spoville, uh, Cresco Bank and Trust, and of course ourselves here at the Play Sports Bar and Grill. So uh, it takes a lot of people like that to do it. And then without them, we cannot have the inter music, the music and entertainment um, that that we re that we provide each and every year. So. Yeah. And of course, your place, the place will be happening this weekend, right? Yeah, place will be here. Yep. Uh, we don't really serve food till after night because uh, we want to make sure the town it makes their money, you know, doing all that homemade food and stuff. But uh, we will serve pizza wings after 5 p.m. till 9. Uh, but yeah, stop in and grab a cold beer. Uh, AC's on cold. I mean, uh, <laughs> of course, TV's in every direction to check out your, to your uh, sports games. So yeah, so it, it's going to be a fun weekend here in Protovin. So, like I say, Darren, every year, all roads. Lead a Parode event for the 46th annual check day. So make a trip over. All right, Mark. We appreciate uh, you taking the time and uh, telling us all about uh, check days coming up this weekend. Best of luck with the event. And uh, thank you, you for uh, what you do for uh, the Parode event community. Thank you, Darren. I appreciate it. Mark Panas uh, joining us. Check days this weekend in Parode event. This Sunday, it is the uh, Northeast Iowa Fellowship for Christian Athlete, Athletes Fields of Faith event uh, coming up at uh, Crestwood High School's football field. And Alicia Denner is with us from the uh, Northeast Iowa Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And Alicia, tell us about the event uh, coming up uh, this Sunday. What's the purpose? Who's invited, etc.? 
Okay. Well, good morning, Darren. Yes. And I have a cheat sheet here because, you know, I'm just a tired mama. So I got to make <laughs> sure I get all my facts straight here. Um, but yeah, we are super excited. Our local fellowship of Christian athletes um, and coaches, uh, and we have a committee over here, um, is putting together our first ever uh, Northeast Iowa Fields of Faith here in Cresco. Wakan has done a, an event similar in the past. And so we've just been super grateful to kind of uh, go to that event, be inspired by it, and then now get to um, host an opportunity for people to join here. Um, so we are inviting, um, you know, everyone from Southern Minnesota to the Cedar Valley and beyond um, to come. Uh, we have um, kind of targeted, you know, uh, students, so kind of that kindergarten through adulthood, grandparents, community members, athletes, parents, coaches, coaches, spouses, um, really anybody um, to come and uh, to Cresco's football field. It's kind of a neat event that way that you get to sit on the football field, which kind of seems like it's like it should be illegal, you know, <laughs> to bring a <laughs> A, a, a lawn chair or a blanket and sit right on the football field. It's just a really cool environment. Um, we kind of have some speakers that'll be up on a stage. And so the environment's just super cool as it gets dark, you know, to, to sit under the lights that way. And um, we get to hear some really cool speakers. Um, and again, before I get to that, it's August 18th. So this coming Sunday night at seven o'clock, we hope it's it's about an hour event. You know, if you do have some of those younger age kiddos to to kind of plan for to sit that long. Um, but really the, the point of it, and it's a free event, um, is to hear some really cool testimonies. Um, we have uh, a couple high school students sharing about their faith. Um, Newt Rogney from Lake Mills is traveling over to share his uh, testimony. We have Jalen Barron, a Riceville student athlete. Um, we have Coach Brian Nickel, head baseball coach over at Luther, who is just really going to give a, a great um, kind of encouragement to coaches, families. You know, there's it's demanding sports and athletics and activities can be so demanding. So just a really cool encouragement to people there. And then, of course, we have one of our our main speakers is Sharon Goodman, who is a former Crestwood grad, a former Iowa Hawkeye girls basketball player um, who has just this really powerful uh, story, testimony of of some really hard things that have happened in her life. Um, has hit some super big highs in life and obviously some super low points. So um, her story is just amazing. And I really think it's just going to be a very special event here um, and uplifting for a lot of people. So that's kind of the about the event. And from a timing perspective uh, with high school activities about ready to begin school to get ready to get back in session, is this kind of the perfect time of year to hold an event like this? Yeah, I think most, you know, if you look up Fields of Faith around not only Iowa, but the country, a lot of them um, kind of hit that October uh, time of year. But, you know, our committee here was really looking for something to kind of boost people up at this time of year. I think it's a super special time of year because you have, so, you know, you know, both my husband and I coach, um, I just got, I just wrapped up a softball season. He, I think today obviously is the first uh, fall, uh, fall sports practice day. And so, you know, in our family, it's like we were reminded the demand of uh, athletics and, and what it takes, especially, you know, like we have a young family. And so the balance that teachers and coaches and parents and, and those grandparents that drive all over the state, um, you know, just that demand. And so, um, you know, I just think that's what's really cool about this time of year. Thank goodness for the state having that week of uh, rest, um, reset, family time um, so that people can, um, you know, not only be excited, but also just feel rested uh, and recovered from the previous season. So. And you mentioned uh, you've been to this event in uh, Walk On, I believe, the last uh, couple of years. Uh, what have you personally uh, taken uh, from that event, and what do you hope uh, people take away from this event coming up next Sunday? You know, coaches, athletes, you know, you, you want to be at an elite level, right? You want to, you want to 
um, constantly doing all of these things to set yourself, your program, you know, whatever it is up for ultimate success. And with that comes a lot of pressure. And so I guess the biggest thing, me personally, when I've gone over to that event in Makan is you come out with this reminder that there is life is so much more sports is so much more than just the outcome on a Friday night or, a, you know, overall record of a season. Um, your, your life is entangled with so many others and the influence that you have um, with your players and your families and just loving the people up around you, not only when it's easy and when you're having success, but through the hard. And so um, an event like this is just so special and unique because it's just that reminder that what we're all trying to do here is so much bigger than just just that that win and uh, just that constant reminder to, to love the people around you well. And as an organizer of this event, uh, how does it feel to have uh, these uh, great uh, kids, a couple of kids uh, coming from Lake Mills and Riceville, obviously Coach Nickel and his story and Sharon Goodman uh, and how proud uh, our area has been of her, uh, not only uh, what she's done on a basketball court, but what she's done off the uh, basketball court. How powerful is it to uh, have all these people willing to share these stories to help others grow? Yeah, I'm just, I've re been reminded of that over and over and over, especially this, this last year in this role. Um, I left teaching just a, a year ago to, to do Fellowship of Christian Athletes ministry full time. And so I get to go all over the place and meet wonderful people. And I'm just reminded God works through people, you know, um, people willing to share the good and hard parts of their life and wanting to impact those around them and encourage one another. Um, that's what it's all about, you know, and um, so many great people willing to drive over to, to be able to, to do that next Sunday night is it's just, it's really, really neat. So, yeah. and, and I think, you know, that's just when oftentimes we go through trials you know, really hard things I found and, and I meet other people who often find this too. Sometimes we go through that trial because once we get through it and we are strong, then we get to help other people going through that similar thing. And so it's just kind of the beautiful reminder that adversity, um, you know, is, is our training ground for life. And uh, from what I understand, this event's going to be held rain or shine. Yes. Yep. Come on over. If, if there does happen to be bad weather, I think right now it's beautiful forecast at 80 degrees and sunny. Um, but if for some reason there'd be um, something pop up, we will be right in the Cresco High School gym. And we're so grateful for uh, the Howard Winnishick School District to kind of loan us their facilities for this event. So just super grateful for that support, too. Anything we're missing? Anything else you want to pass on about uh, this event? I don't think so. I think, um, you know, just if, if you're in the area and even if it's a little bit of a drive, I just encourage, um, you know, fill up a car uh, with with kids, with friends, um, parents, uh, coaches, get, get in the car and drive over. It'll be so worth your time, um, you know, as just the pace of sports and all the club sports and just the demand of everything. Um, this should just be a really good reset um, recharge, uh, refuel, if you will, before um, the next great season ahead here. So um, come on over to Cresco's uh, football field, August 18th at seven o'clock. Would love to see all of you there. And I'll uh, let you give uh, just a final full uh, invitation uh, for uh, folks to come over uh, to Cresco next uh, Sunday night. Yes, yes. Come on over. We'd love to see you. All right, uh, Alicia, we appreciate you taking some time to tell us about the uh, Fields of Faith event uh, coming up next Sunday night at Crestwood High School. Thanks for taking the time, and more importantly, uh, thanks for uh, what you do for uh, young people in our area. Thank you so much, Darren. Alicia Denner with the Fellowship for Christian Athletes, Northeast Iowa Fields of Faith coming up Sunday night, Crestwood High School's football field from 7 until 8 p.m. Our topic of discussion is a series of farmland leasing and management workshops that uh, are taking place throughout the area right now. And our guest is Joseph Lensing. He is with Iowa State University Extension. And 
Joseph, before we get into the uh, specific schedule uh, of uh, meetings in our area, what is the uh, what will folks learn by attending these uh, meetings that uh, you will you are putting on over these uh, couple week period? So what we hope to achieve with our farmland leasing meetings is a way for landowners to get a fair calculation on rental rates for their properties, as well as a way for growers to understand how things have changed over the year. These meetings are conducted every year and the results of the surveys that Iowa State does is a lot of what's in the book. So the farmland leasing we make a 99 page book that covers a lot of ways to calculate rental rates, some tax and legal changes, as well as communication that should be expected with these agreements. And how much do issues related to uh, farmland leasing and management change from year to year? Is it a constant thing? Does it depend on uh, other factors, economic factors, et cetera? How much in general do things change from year to year? Kind of a loaded question. Okay. Year to year, we've got we've got legal changes, so that can definitely put a spin on things. I would say the the changes year to year are more so going to rely on the commodity markets. And what we've seen here over the past couple months is the commodity markets soften a lot. So that is a, a big area in which I'm currently fielding questions. And I would say that going into 25 is going to be where the real focus is in relation to rental rates. And related to that, uh, how many of those factors are, can producers control? How many are outside of their control? And is uh, part of the discussion uh, trying to keep everything or as much as you can under control uh, moving forward? Yeah, so... <clears throat> It goes both ways. Okay. Um, there's obviously things that, that are out of our control, but there are things that are in our control. Control, um, Yeah, commodity markets going to be outside of our control for the most part. But what we try to, the main reason for these meetings is to establish a base level of communication to give everybody the information that they need to go through with a properly written and properly followed through lease agreement. Um, that's a big area of what we hit on. We've got forms in our 99 page farmland leasing book that are kind of a baseline for allowing the communication to be sound so that there's no confusion or misinterpretation later on. And looking at the uh, schedule of your meetings uh, coming up, I know uh, you got one uh, this afternoon in uh, Clayton County uh, in El Cater, but uh, I know uh, you're requiring pre-registration uh, two days before the uh, meeting that you plan to attend, but in uh, our neck of the woods, Howard County, Chickasaw County, Alamakee County, and Winnesheet County, uh, you got meetings coming up next week. Uh, tell us when those meetings will be taking place. Yeah, so each of those days, I'll be having two meetings. So uh, Monday, August the 19th, I'll be in Howard County in the morning at nine o'clock. And then I'll be in Chickasaw County in the afternoon at one o'clock, also on Monday the 19th. And then Thursday the 22nd, I will be in Allen McKee in the morning at 9.30 and Winnesheck County at 1.30. And uh, how do folks uh, sign up for these events? So call the county in which you plan to attend, call the county extension office and they will get you registered and take care of you from there. And what is the registration fee? $20 for registration fee that covers the meeting as well as that 99 page farmland leasing book I've been referencing. And uh, it looks like uh, perhaps uh, there's an opportunity to do a statewide webinar uh, coming up towards the end of this month. Is that correct? Yes, that will be Monday the 26th. And for that, to register for that, I would call your local extension office as well, and they can get you signed up for that. Anything else we need to cover? Anything else the uh, folks need to know uh, regarding uh, these meetings in our area starting next week? I would say if there's anything I'd like to touch on, it's anybody that has an interest or is considering new lease agreements or 
anybody who's on the side of a lease agreement from the landowner perspective or the renter perspective, the grower perspective, any of those are our target markets for this and any and all can attend. All right, uh, Joseph, we appreciate you taking a few moments to uh, tell us about these uh, all important meetings uh, coming up next week in our area. Thanks for the time. You bet. Thank you very much. Joseph Lensing from uh, Iowa State University Extension uh, Farmland Lease and Management Meetings uh, next week in Howard and Chickasaw County on Monday and Alamakee and Winnipeg County on Thursday. Time now for our monthly conversation with Decorah School Superintendent Tim Cronin. And Tim, a uh, couple of uh, chances for uh, the public to go uh, before or to the polls, I should say, uh, for a, a couple of referendums uh, coming up. Uh, first things first, uh, there will be a two-question referendum coming up in September. First of all, when will that election be held, and what will uh, the election uh, be asking the public to do? Uh, yes, thanks for asking. So September 10th, uh, that's going to be a Tuesday. Uh, we have a special election. Two items are on the ballot. One is... Uh, to renew the revenue purpose statement, and that deals with the district's ability to, to use uh, the one cent sales tax, the save penny uh, revenues that come in. Um, that, uh, and so what we're doing is renewing what we can use it for and extending it because currently it ends in 2031 and we're going to extend it to 2051. Um, that gives us the ability, the board's already passed a resolution that if they need extra funds for the elementary project, they can borrow against those, those future revenues and fund that. Um, and so then that's just kind of uh, gives the board a little bit of a, a, a cushion against costs, although we uh, also hired a, a construction manager risk. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So question one is just extending the revenue purpose statement. That tax is the one cent sales tax that's currently in place. The second question is to increase the debt uh, uh, service levy. And that's the ability of, that's the amount of money that the district's allowed to uh, borrow against future project. I, in my terms, I always view it as kind of our, uh, what's our uh, our ability to borrow, uh, what's our mortgage payment allowed to be? And so um, right now that figure is $2.70. To go above 270 cents, you have to pass a, a the um, uh, ballot question that we're asking uh, has to be uh, a yes. And so what we're saying is we want to take that not to exceed $4.05, um, which is an increase in, in property tax. Now, we, we need to do that because the cost of the elementary project is estimated at $38 million and the only amount of money we can borrow with the two dollars and seventy cents that we currently have that we're currently paying uh, is twenty eight million. So we had to kind of close that gap. Um, we know in working with the latest valuations on property tax and with uh, uh, a couple of different firms who do this professionally that we don't have to go the two dollars and seventy cents. We're we're asking not to exceed four dollars and five cents. But if the referendum passes in November, it will actually just add eighty six cents. So. The property tax will go up uh, from two dollars and seventy cents to three dollars and eighty four cents uh, if the ballot in September passes, and then the bond referendum in November would pass. Um, so that's what that's what we're asking in September is extend the revenue purpose statement to twenty fifty one and have permission to take the debt service levy above two seventy, not to exceed four hundred five. And then you kind of put an asterisk there, understanding that we're not taking the tax up to four hundred five, that we would just take it to the three fifty six. And when it comes to uh, necessary votes to pass both those questions, what does the revenue uh, purpose statement uh, referendum need? What does the uh, debt service levy referendum need? Uh, referend, uh, RPS extension, revenue purpose statement extension, that needs 50%. Uh, we do need a super majority to exceed the debt service. Um, so that, uh, um, that requires that 60%. And I should say, before I forget, we've calculated what that 84 cents, and there's a calculator if you go to Decora, decoracsdfuture.org. Uh, there's, a, there's a calculator that you can put in and say what your home valuation is worth, and it will tell you what your increase in taxes will be. For a, for a home valued at $250,000, taking their, your debt service levy from 270 to three, 
eighty or three fifty six, that will be a ninety five dollar a year increase in your property tax. And you talk about the asking uh, related to that debt service levy. It's currently at two dollars and seventy cents per thousand dollars. And you're asking to go up to 405, knowing the fact you won't go all the way there. Why is that 405 in place? And I know when it comes to uh, levies and schools, it's kind of a complicated thing to explain to a lay person or a not very smart person like me. But explain why you're asking to go to 405, knowing the fact you won't need in all likelihood to go to that level. Yeah, well, we 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 can't go to that level because we're only asking to borrow thirty eight million for the school. The two two uh, caps on that levy uh, set by Co Iowa Code is the two dollars and seventy cents or the four dollars and five cents. So you usually just have one or the other. You're usually at two seventy, or you get voter permission to exceed two seventy, and then then you're saying, well, we can't. Absolutely, there's no vote. I can't do. The district could not do a third vote and say we want to go to above 405. 405 is the maximum that anyone in the state is allowed to go. We just happen to know with regards to this specific elementary project, it would just add that that 84 cents that we've talked about to the existing uh, or 86 cents to the existing uh, $2.70. After that, district residents are going to go to the polls again in November. When will that election be? or that referendum be uh, more accurately, and what will voters be voting on that day? Yeah, so that, that'll that just have the one question, um, and the November 5th election, and that's a presidential election, and that's going to have the question about uh, if the board's allowed to sell $38 million in general obligation bonds to fund a new elementary school. Um, and so that's the question in November. Um, I guess backing up a little bit. Some people, we've got a lot of, we're, we're trying to promote that there's three three votes, two elections and, and one project. Um, I have been asked if, what happens if the, if one or both of the projects would fail in September, we would still have the November election because uh, the November election is permission to sell the bonds. The September election is just the ability to exceed that. You, you have to pass both of them, but the November election will still go on even if one of the two of the September elections fails. You could always bring one of those items back in March. If if the ability to exceed the debt service would not pass in September, it could always be on a, on a March 2025 ballot. Of course, for logistically and to be the most economical and to get the project moving along, we sure hope that uh, the, uh, the two votes pass in September so that then the third can pass in November without any hiccups. And the November vote would require a 60% supermajority, correct? Exactly. Another supermajority is required for that geo bond. Any, is there any place out there uh, where uh, you touched on uh, the tax calculator that uh, folks can go to? Is there any place out there that uh, folks can get more generalized information about these three votes? Uh, yes. The, the website that is just informational is Decora. CSD future, all kind of one word, period.org. And so on, on that website, we've just got information about what the facility needs are, uh, what the, a little bit on the conceptual plan. Um, obviously we're not in design stage yet. We're just kind of, uh, so generally after the bond would pass, then we'll design what each classroom will look like, but we've got a conceptual plan. The big ideas on the conceptual plan is to, uh, move the new school farther west on the Hively Island, kind of toward where the tennis courts and the ball field sit. Um, that will help with the traffic flow. We're going to put a bus uh, pull out behind off of Hively so we don't have parents and buses in the same spot. And we'll have green space at both the west and the east side of that project. So, so the conceptual plan isn't gonna, you're not gonna get a tour what each classroom looks like because that's that's obviously not done yet. Uh, the website also has our the tab for property tax impact, how to vote, and then just frequently asked questions. We've gotten a lot of good questions that have come in and um, we've tried to put on there. There's a nice history of the Decora property tax that you can look back uh, to 2014 and you kind of kind of see where the level's been at and the district's uh, um, 
lowered those down a little bit, um, how we compare with other districts in the state. So lots of good information. And again, that's decorahcsdfuture.org. Um, there's opportunities to scan that off a QR code on Q, QR code on different spots. And we're going to get some flyers up about that as well. Anything else folks need to uh, know about the election and the referendums coming up that we haven't touched on? You know, uh, the one thing that we just got scheduled today, um, we're going to tie in some community open houses to tour the facilities. We, uh, if, if you're a voter in the community and you haven't had children for a long time or never had children, and you're not sure what the, what the need is like, please come to John Klein School or Westside Elementary uh, both nights, a uh, couple Wednesdays, the 21st and the 28th. We're going to have uh, a community open house from 6 to 730 uh, with folks uh, giving tours and kind of highlighting some of the some of the needs uh, at those schools and classrooms. And that's this month? That is this month. So that's, okay. uh, uh, you know, basically... Today is Tuesday, a week from next Wednesday. Come and, and tour John Klein. I I strongly, I've had people say, you know, we've got to get, if if you're on the fence or you're not sure, please come and look and, and see what the school's like. The, we won't have school in session. So um, obviously people can be in the building and, and kind of look around and we'll have folks there providing information and giving tours. Our next topic of uh, discussion, I've got to take the blame for this one because I, when we touched on it last month, I said, well, we're going to have a resolution to this conference thing. Unfortunately, we're not at that point, so I'll take the full blame on uh, that one, uh, Tim. Give us the latest on uh, where potentially uh, Decorah could be conference-wise in 25-26. Where's the discussion at? Where's the process at? Well, uh, um we had our mediation and a couple of days, maybe four or five days after the mediation, we uh, got a letter that said uh, the recommendation from the mediator. So that's the, someone from the boys association, the girls union, and then the uh, uh, hired mediator from Drake law, their recommendation is not to place Decora in the upper Iowa conference. And it was a one sentence um, statement which kind of left us, I mean, I can surmise that the main reason was the size of the schools in the upper Iowa. It didn't provide, uh, we were kind of hoping for more on what what they were thinking, because obviously the girls union and boys association kind of know our situation. And if they want to recommend a, a conference for us to apply, that would be great. But the mediation recommendation is now with director McKinsey Snow we are waiting to schedule our hearing date with Mackenzie Snow. She's kind of the final arbiter in this process. Um, I'm not going to be too optimistic uh, that there she would give a result any different than what's been recommended to her, but we will certainly make a case of why it's going to be difficult for Decor to be in any different conference. I can say that uh, even though we were surprised by this decision, uh, we weren't caught flat-footed. Um, one thing I like about working with Adam Riley is uh, we started talking about, well, what what are we going to do if? And so we kind of already talked through some scenarios. We've had some conversations with, with uh, ADs at another conference. Um, and at this time, we're not really saying much more on that because we still want to wait till we get the final resolution on the upper Iowa. But we will have we will have a plan see i guess at this point in time if if we're not placed in the upper iowa and we'll move forward with that um it's getting kind of late in the game to even though you think about it, it's still a year away it's getting a lot late in the game to get admitted to a conference and get schedules built up and stuff like that um so we will continue to effort on that but we really need to get the final um I guess have our have our uh, opportunity to have our presenter case to Director Snow, who's the director of the Iowa um, Department of Education, so she can make her final decision, and we can work off of that. And from a process perspective, when you get that hearing in front of Mackenzie Snow, will she make a decision that day, or will she have a little bit of a time frame to make that decision? How will that process go? I, it's my understanding that she has to give a decision either way by the end of August, but I haven't counted those days exactly. Um, I would assume that she would hear the hear our case and not, you know, I'm hoping we'll get something scheduled next week 
um, or even later this week, we're, uh, we've kind of told our attorney, we'll take any appointment we can get. Um, but I don't think I'll, it'll be instantaneous. I think it'll be another one of those couple of days and we'll get a notification. But not having been through this process, I don't know how it will work. All right. A couple more issues. I know these are kind of uh, statewide uh, issues that uh, we are dealing with right now. And a couple of uh, issues, and I, I know these aren't directly related to your school districts, but they've been issues uh, in the state of Iowa that have been talked about and gotten some news attention. I know the Iowa legislature passed a, a law last year allowing school personnel to be armed uh, related to potential uh, tragic situations like we saw in Perry last year. But I see there's a lot of hoops that have uh, you need to jump through, and uh, the guidelines related to this really haven't been finalized uh, yet. Uh, and I believe there was a couple of school districts that passed resolutions at the board level, but their insurance company said, and eh, we're not going to insure you if that's going to happen. Is this one of those things that uh, even though the law was probably well-intended, realistically, the practical application uh, just ain't going to cut it? Oh, well, I'll say this. Uh, we're not going to do something that get, causes us to get canceled by our insurance cover. Uh, so, and since EMC literally insures probably 95% of the schools in Iowa, um, I, I don't see anybody doing that. Um, yeah, I there'd have to be a dramatic change for, for any school district in Iowa to even start having the board level discussion. And just to point out, the two schools that I remember that passed resolutions, that that was a year before this law was put into play. Now, they passed a resolution, which was their prerogative. And, you know, boards can have board policy, but they passed this, this board policy about allowing teachers to be armed. I'm not sure if that aligned with even the state law, but it didn't matter because at the time, you know, they were told by the EMC insurance, like, we're not going to cover you. So they had to then backtrack so that would have happened i'm pretty sure that happened like in may and june uh, june of 23 okay. um, the difference this year being is we have a state law that says it's allowed um but again emc is not going to insure us nobody's going to do it and i i haven't even heard of anybody even having that discussion with their board and, and i you know i don't hear everything but i do talk to lots of people so and, and maybe it's happened somewhere in iowa but um yeah i i there'd have to be a, a seismic type shift for something different to happen there. I believe there are about 10 school districts in the state of Iowa that are doing the four day school week uh, calendar this year. Again, we're emphasizing this hasn't been discussed at all in Decora or anywhere in our area for that matter. In your mind, is that worthy of a discussion uh, in based on your experience uh, in the educational field? You're really bringing them all up today, aren't you, Darren? Why not? I, um, I, my notebook's big, Tim. My okay, notebook's big. Okay, things I want to ask Corona next time I talk to him. Uh, gosh, uh, uh, I think the the big thing that for me has always been whatever you do with the school calendar. There's a lot of traditions that are that are ingrained in that, um, and you've got to work with you got to make it work for parents with young children, and so um, I haven't gotten into what those schools are doing for, you know, the, let's say the pre-K through sixth grade children, what do they do on that Friday? Do the parents have to stay home from work every Friday? Do they have to find chick care? Or is there some kind of community organization uh, or is that organized? So um, we haven't, uh, I have not even been asked that question until today here in Decorah. Um, so uh, I think we, that would not, we're probably not ready for any kind of discussion on that. I. You know, I know uh, Waco down in Southeast Iowa has been doing it for a long time and they really like it. Um, and then uh, what is it? Martindale, St. Mary's just went to it this year and it was a big thing for their superintendent was talking about the staff retention and how it's been really hard for them to hire teachers, but it wasn't there. Wasn't that this year? Um, that would probably pique our interest here if it if it helped with recruiting better staff, that might be a reason that we would consider it. But uh, I just think that uh, um, before we start anything, we'd have to really have a good idea what, how we were going to 
uh, help those those families because there's a large part of school that this that helps families you know manage children so parents can go to work um, and I don't I was an elementary teacher and I, I'm not afraid to say that that maybe not always uh, something that people say in schools but that's part of our role in society and one more big picture issue uh, before uh, we move on uh, to uh, other things. The cell phone policy, uh, I know uh, the Des Moines uh, district has gone to a policy where they don't allow phones at all in uh, the school district. Uh, first of all, what is the Decorah district uh, policy related to students and cell phones? What goes into developing that policy and what would make a district potentially change that policy? So our policy is outlined in our student handbook. Um, it's not a board policy. It's just a, it's like a, a decor high school handbook policy. Uh, students are not supposed to use their cell phones during the class. That doesn't mean that they can't have them on their person, but um, you know, if they violate that, there is a little bit of discretion with how the teacher wants to handle it. Um, and every situation is slightly different um, with, with regards to that. How would we go about changing it? Well, that would probably be something that would come from the Decora leadership. Uh, the I'm sure Mr. Hurst would engage the building leadership team. You know, I think if it's a problem, you want to address it. If you're not having a problem with it and it's manageable um, and it works out fine, then you don't you don't you don't need to change things that you know don't work on something that's fixed. Work on the broken things. So, but that's that's where it would come from. And quite honestly, there's another discussion that we haven't quite had in Decora yet. So. Um, I'm not saying we won't ever, but we're just, we haven't had that discussion yet. We've touched on quite a few issues. Uh, let's not forget next week, kids come back into the building. Uh, are, you uh, already, uh, are you all ready for the start of a new school year? Um, I, th that, that's the third time today I've been asked if I'm ready for the start of school. And it, it feels different as a superintendent than it, than it does as a building principal, than it does as a elementary school teacher. Um, I can tell you that, Every day we get closer and more people, uh, the energy level picks up and it's just a, it's a super fun, exciting time. And uh, we want the first day of school to be perfect and we'll do our best, but there's invariably uh, stuff that uh, uh, maybe isn't perfect, but the first day of school always comes and, and seemingly uh, you, you can do all you can do to prepare for it, but it's going to come regardless. So um, but staffing wise, we're at a good place. We've got teachers in all the classrooms. We welcome the new teachers uh, Thursday uh, for the new teacher breakfast. So that's exciting. Um, all staff come back on the 19th. We do have the uh, meet and greet nights on Wednesday, the 21st. So check the times for that. It kind of starts at the lower level. I think West Side is 430. John Klein is five. Then I suppose Carrie Lee's 530, maybe six at the middle school. But check, you know, obviously that information's come out. So we have meet and greet the night. That's Wednesday night. Then teachers have kind of uh, Thursday to get final preparations. School starts on Friday, the 23rd. Uh, as a reminder, that's the state law that you can't start school before the 23rd. So um, while some people wonder why we would start on a Friday, there's a little bit to get, you know, the first day nerves out of the way and learn the routine and then uh, have a full week. So won't be a wasted day, but uh, um, yeah, it's uh, uh, that's next week. So, uh, but it'll be super exciting to have staff back in the buildings, and you know, people come back with a lot of energy, and it'll be it'll be a good time, and we'll be ready for students on Friday. Anything else on your notebook or uh, Microsoft Word document? Um, I don't think so. Um, you know, uh, we did uh, as a district that the board approved a construction manager at risk and that's a that's we hired a company which they'll work with our this is kind of a new thing for schools university of uh, private institutions have been able to use construction managers at risk for years and university of iowa uses that i think virtually in all their large construction projects but they're they're a firm that will work with our architect in the design phase to keep costs down and we will be guaranteed uh, an elementary school built for 38 million. So, uh, you know, unless we would modify it, but we shouldn't have to do have change orders that drive up prices or there shouldn't be any hidden costs in construction because we've hired a construction manager at risk. Um, 
and we're excited. Uh, talk to other school districts that are doing it. Got really good feedback from them, and um, we're real excited about uh, Byron Construction that was hired to do that for the district. So that was probably the other big highlight of last night's board meeting. All right, uh, Tim. Appreciate the uh, time and the knowledge. Happy start to the school year. Thank you very much. Tim Cronin, Decorah Schools Superintendent. We thank the four very fun and interesting people we had a chance to talk to on this morning's program. Mark Ponish with the Check Days Committee in Protovin. Check Days starting tomorrow night, continuing until Sunday night in Protovin. Alicia Denner with the Northeast Iowa Fellowship for Christian Athletes, the Northeast Iowa Fields of Faith event uh, taking place Sunday night in Cresco. Joseph Lensing with Iowa State University Extension uh, Farm Land Lease Management Meetings uh, taking place next week uh, for Howard County, Chickasaw County, Wenatchee County, and Elm Key County, and Decorah School Superintendent Tim Cronin. Don't forget, we put these shows on YouTube each and every week. We realize you're busy getting the kids ready for school, getting yourself ready for fall. All sorts of things going on. You can't always be near a radio or a smart speaker on Thursday mornings at 9 o'clock. But we want to bring these interesting interviews to you on your schedule. If you're out uh, gallivanting on YouTube, go to 8-15 Our Town Program. That's a great way to get it. We also put these links up on all of our LA Communications radio stations Facebook pages. Another way we do our best to... Uh, Keep in touch with our communities here at LA Communications. Thanks, guest. Thanks, sponsor to Court of Bank and Trust. Most importantly, we thank you. That's right, you for tuning in, for logging on, or for watching our town on 949 and 99 won the river.